Welcome to the Truth and Precept channel. Now, as many of us are de uh, deconstructing our previous beliefs and finding how much work is really involved in the process of seeking for truth and what is real and what is the real path to actually get to the celestial kingdom, this is something my spouse and I have wondered about many times throughout our journey, you know, wondering, are we on the right path? Have we been deceived along the way? Is there something we still believe that isn't true? And so, and what does our future look like in this life and the next? So I want to approach this topic from looking at Doctrine and Covenants 76. Uh, Doctrine 76, uh, section 76 was given in 1832. This is a vision that Joseph Smith and Sidney Ridden had uh, while they were uh, re while they were working on uh, and studying the Bible, and they read about the resurrection of the just, and it was a revelation that was came to be known as the vision, and it describes the path about how someone can become a celestial person. Now, President Nelson gave a talk in October 2023 general conference called Think Celestial. And mostly, you know, he, he gave us this, this catchphrase to tell us uh, about when you encounter different types of life challenges to think celestial. And he said at the very end, the Lord is directing us to build these temples to help us think celestial. And so let's review um, Dr. Covenant 76 because he didn't, uh, unfortunately, President Nelson did not mention any, any references to this section which addresses the celestial kingdom in, in his talk. And so, so let's see how... Uh, who will inherit the celestial kingdom and how the temple fits in, as he's as he mentioned in his talk. So I'm going to list here uh, in quotes actual uh, quotations from DNC 76, and I've kind of called out the different verses uh, around certain points. So here I want to show the authority of of and. Uh, you know the, the weight of this revelation, you know, as as held by by the saints at that time through our day. So starting in verse 14 here, it says, "Jesus Christ, we saw and with whom we conversed in the heavenly vision." So Joseph Smith and Sidney Ridden says they saw Jesus Christ and they actually conversed with him. We beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, for we saw him. And we heard the voice bearing record. And while we were yet in the spirit, the Lord commanded us that we should write the vision, which the voice out of the heavens bore record unto us. And we heard the voice saying, write the vision. And again, we bear record for we saw and heard. And this is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. Now, now this is uh, just about, I think, as authoritative from a prophet, you know, as any scripture that we have in the standard works that you're ever going to read. He, he's, he's really given the weight of his words here of we, we saw Jesus, we talked with him, right? We heard him, he, you know, we spoke to him and we were commanded to write, uh, write the vision, the things that we saw and, and heard. And so it doesn't really get more explicit than what we're going to hear here. Um, and God is going to tell us how to be saved in the celestial kingdom. So let's look at those verses. And it's covered in, in a whopping three verses here, verses 51 through 53. And this is a summary that I've taken. It says that these people received the testimony of Jesus and believed on his name, baptized by immersion by water. They keep the commandments for forgiveness of all their sins. 
received the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, by one ordained and sealed to this power. They overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. What does this sound like? To me, this looks like the components of the doctrine of Christ. And so who are those who will be uh, inheriting the celestial kingdom? It is those who basically, as we are expounded here, the those who follow the doctrine of Christ. No more and no less than what is required. This is it. That's This is all that's given uh, by God that he is commanded to write. To jo you know, Joseph Smith commanded to write this. And, and Jesus even gives us a warning about adding to his doctrine when he visited the Nephites in 35, chapter 11. And let's start in verse 39. Jesus said this, Verily, I, verily I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and whoso buildeth upon this buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And whoso shall declare more or less than this and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil, and is not built upon my rock. But he buildeth upon a sandy foundation, and the gates of hell stand open to receive such when the floods come and the wind, winds beat them, beat upon them. So as we think about what we are told here, you know, the LDS Church has certainly added to the requirements to making to making it to the celestial kingdom, which now includes the ordinances of washing and anointing and the temple endowment and temple marriage. And so the question I'm, I'm asking is, did God change the requirements for the celestial kingdom later on? Was it too easy before in Joseph's day? So he had church leaders perhaps add more steps for later on, like in our day. And another question, right? How does one get ordained and sealed to the power of giving the Holy Spirit to another? And the concept of quote unquote sealed is is absent from church manuals and talks that I've been able to find. And that seems like a critical piece that's missing. And Perhaps that's why nothing really seems to happen when men in the church lay their hands on new members, most of who are of eight years of age, and commands by their priesthood to receive the Holy Ghost. Have any of those men been, been sealed to that power to be able to give it? Well, the, the, uh, the church manuals and talks, as I said, are silent on this matter. Well, this seems to be a key component here. So now that we've seen the requirements, let's see what is in store for those people who keep the, to the straight and narrow doctrine of Christ and do not deviate onto other paths. And I'm just going to read these through here. So they are they who are the church of the firstborn. The Father has given them all things. They are they who are priests and kings, and I've had priestess and queens, who have received of his fullness and of his glory. So they receive the same glory of that God is in. They receive of his glory. Right? They are priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek. They are gods because right, they are the sons of God. They are they shall overcome all things. Uh, these dwell in the presence of God and his Christ forever and ever. Uh, now, I've used this word of raptured, or and it says later on, actually, I think in verse 105, that they're caught up. But that's that, that concept here. But they are caught up into the heavens, into the clouds of heaven when Christ comes. They who shall have part in the first resurrection, in the resurrection of just, are these people. We're also further, it further adds, um, th who are to come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. Which kind of makes me think this is, maybe we have not a complete understanding of what New Jerusalem or Mount Zion is. 
and that it is perhaps not here on Earth, and that maybe we are, the people who qualify will be quote unquote raptured up to the heavenly place, which is the holiest of all. They are also those who come to an they come to an innumerable company of angels, and they also come to the general assembly in the church of Enoch. So if we remember that story, right, that Enoch went and preached to a wicked people and and prepared a people to be a Zion people, and they got taken up into heaven. And and they are the, of the church of the firstborn. Those names their, their names are written in heaven. They are just men made perfect through Jesus and his atonement. These are they, to all the stuff that we have just read, whose bodies are celestial, whose glory is that of the Son, even the glory of God, the highest of all. And then later on, after, you know, they have the vision of the terrestrial vision and and after that it says now th and now this is the end of the vision and the lord commanded us to write while we were yet in the spirit so the writing this stuff as it's coming right? I, th I think he had a uh, a clerk writing it down as they were dictating what they were seeing and this, so this wasn't after the fact it was right in the moment uh they were they were documenting what they were what they were seeing and, and hearing um, now, there should be no doubt that the requirements of the doctrine of Christ that we were just given, right, and, and only those requirements, lead to what we just read of the highest blessings that we can imagine. Right? There is no other path or covenant path, as we say today. Let's continue here. On here, that this is the last slide, uh, and we'll continue in verse 92 of section 76, which picks it back up, talking about the celestial kingdom, and almost kind of a summary. Thus, we saw the glory of the celestial, which excels in all things, where God, even the Father, reigns upon his throne forever and ever. They who dwell in his presence are the church of the firstborn. He makes them equal in power and in might and in dominion. And the glory of the celestial is one, even as the glory of the sun is one. I want to pause there for a moment. This is very interesting because after Joseph Smith, the church leaders began teaching that there were actually three levels within the celestial kingdom. And in order to obtain the highest, right, they needed to participate in the in what the leaders were teaching as new doctrine of having multiple wives and concubines contained in Doctrine and Covenants 132 that was revealed in 1852. But here we're told that the glory of the celestial is is one, just like the sun is is one. It, there's doesn't really give a sense of there's multiple levels, uh, you know, kind of sub-glories within the sun. Uh, continuing, they will be caught up and received into the cloud. This is kind of that rapture concept. And this is the end of the vision which we saw, which we were commanded to write while we were yet in the spirit. So at the time of this revelation, it was called in, in its day by the saints, such as uh, William W. Phelps, quote unquote, the greatest news that was ever published to man. And in this section, as we just covered, we are given only the simple doctrine of Christ as requirements for those to become celestial and part of the church of the firstborn, to be able to dwell in God's presence and to be able to share in all that he has. And this lines up with other witnesses of the scriptures. And we just covered 30 Nephi 11. And so the, the LDS temple appears to have added to these requirements, which require church members to pay 10% of their income to the church, uh, be required to place a man between them and God, 
and and to not be able to contradict uh, those leaders uh, independent of whether they say something is you know is true or not you can't contradict them and, and there's a dozen other requirements that are asked during the temple recommend question uh, interview and so I ask again did God make it harder by adding requirements later on to his doctrine or are the requirements that we have in the church today are these the commandments of men and I'll let you ponder that. Thank you.